I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Mrs. Suzanne Ruff. She's a member of AAKP's National Board of Directors and an accomplished author who has used her great communication talents to write the book entitled The Reluctant Donor. But perhaps most notably, Suzanne is one of the courageous members of our, of our society and who has given more of herself than most. She is, a living, she is a living kidney donor to her sister, Joanne. Suzanne's family has been greatly affected by polycystic kidney disease, and she is, she is the only one of all of her siblings that does not have the disease. Her family story, struggle with the disease and experiences from giving the gift of life have all led to her, all led her to write the book, The Reluctant Donor. Suzanne, my dear friend, we are honored to have you join us. And let me let you take the stage and get the session started. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, but don't believe him. I wasn't very courageous. I was terrified. Um, and because of you and your work and your colleagues, I would not have much of a family. We have 23 members and counting who had or have polycystic kidney disease. There are some that are not wanting because of the discrepancy between uh, pre-existing conditions that still exist won't publicly admit it. So it is a pleasure to be here this morning as part of the AAKP George Washington University event, um, bringing together patients and patient families like myself and professionals like you for, from a global perspective to discuss what is being done to advance science and research in order to create more care options for those who suffer from the heartache, the pain, and the suffering of kidney disease. I'm pleased to introduce this next session, Clinical Trials Reinvented, Remote Technologies and Reduced Patient Burden, along with my co-moderator from George Washington University and the Chief of Nephrology at the VA Medical Center, Dr. Samar Patel. Our esteemed panelists include Dr. Michael Walsh, Associate Professor at McMaster University, who is joining us from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Ms. Courtney Fierek, Director of Advocacy and Relations with the Continuum Cl Clinical, and my dear friend and passionate pa patient advocate, Mrs. Diana Kleins, Executive Director of AAKP. Dr. Walsh, I'd like to welcome you to the panel. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk with you here today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about randomized controlled trials generally, and then some specific ones over the last year-ish, and uh, some things that we expect to happen over the next five years or so. I am going to talk a little bit about some medications that are being used off-label. Um, and I am talking really about things that I'm involved in, mostly because that's what I know the best, uh, but also to shamelessly plug my own work. So what I'll talk about is why do we really need randomized controlled trials, because we talk a lot about research as a bucket. This is a very specific component of it. Um, talk a little bit about some important trials that have happened in the last year, and then some new ones that are underway. So we often ask ourselves, really, does the treatment we're providing improve our patients' lives? And that is our goal. It's to make, uh, help people live longer and live better lives. And people are incredibly complex. It's not just the person's genes, it's their environment, it's their social situation, it's their medications, their interaction with healthcare, their interaction with their family, all these other emotional, social, and physical factors that create their health and disease. And because it's complex, intervening in any one specific area can have unpredictable results, either it doesn't do anything, or not much. It may do things that we didn't expect or didn't want, and it may do things much better than we thought. And we really need to try and isolate the effects of individual treatments or therapies, whether they be drugs, counseling, behavioral therapies, any of these things, we really want to be able to tell what is from all of the other complexities of human health and what part of it is actually the part that we intervened upon. And that's where randomized trials come in, because they are the best way of isolating what the effect of a therapy is on human health. 
We normally talk about comparing apples to apples or oranges to oranges, but in the randomized controlled trial, it's not about apples and apples, oranges and oranges. It's about getting an average number of apples and oranges in one group compared to another average number in the other group in order to ensure that overall the groups look the same, but not that any one individual is the same. And that's important because individuals are so different that we should never expect to completely homogenize the groups. In fact, if we look at the ways in which we try and make things apples and apples and oranges and oranges and we compare them using non-randomized techniques, no matter how advanced we get, we can expect to get the answer wrong about one in four times. Sometimes that's probably acceptable. Sometimes what we're planning on doing is so low risk or it's so obviously uh, the right thing to do that you can, don't have to worry about being right all the time. Sometimes though, when things are new, sometimes when you're worried about unexpected effects, then you have to be more certain than, than three out of four. And if we look, and this has already been shown once by, uh, by Dominic, is that we're really doing the poorest job of all the internal medicine specialties right now. Now you could say maybe that's because we're actually so good at our jobs that we don't need any more evidence, but I think that's probably incorrect. And in fact, if you look at the global burden of disease estimates about what is causing death globally, Kidney disease is the third most uh, rapid rising cause of death globally. We're only beat by diabetes and dementia. If you look at other areas, cardiovascular disease, which leads the pack in terms of the generation of evidence on therapies, they actually are now lower than the, uh, than the population growth for most areas. The, where, the major area in which they exceed population growth is in the developing world uh, where they have less access to care. And of course, this is now very commonly shown data is that we expect this problem to get worse. Part of it is, is that in other areas of medicine, life-ending events are being prevented, and so the epidemic of people who are able to make it towards uh, end-stage kidney disease will grow. Part of it is the growth of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and other diseases of chronic nature within our populations. But we do expect to potentially go from three million people of now receiving dialysis globally to over six and a half million. And part of that will also be that there will be growth in access to end-stage renal disease care across the, the world. So now I'm going to talk about a couple of different trials that have happened, and then I'm going to pair each of them with some trials that actually I think will further advance knowledge in this area. And some of these are very exciting. So in the last year, you, you can't talk about changes in uh, the care of patients with kidney disease without talking about SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are drugs that help us pee sugar, um, particularly in people with diabetes, it seems that this has been a good idea, but it may not have been good just in terms of helping with diabetes. It may help actually in offloading the pressure of the glomerulus so that there's less uh, work on the filters. And the biggest news that's happened in the last few months has been the publication of the Credence trial, which tests one particular SGLT tube inhibitor called canagliflozin. So in 4,200 patients with type 2 diabetes and reduced kidney function treated with either 100 milligrams of canagliflozin or a matching placebo, there was a major reduction in an endpoint of end-stage kidney disease, uh, a large reduction in kidney function or renal or cardiovascular deaths, something that hasn't been seen in the past 18 years prior, uh, which is a major advance. And in fact, the size of the effect on, uh, on kidney function is much larger than mine might have, might have predicted otherwise. It also reduced cardiovascular deaths, cardiovascular death stroke and MI, uh, hospitalizations for heart failure, and uh, renal endpoints alone. A really major advance. Now that's not the end of the story though for SGLT2 inhibitors. There's a large number of trials that are coming out and each one has a slightly different twist on the, the Credence uh, uh, flavor. So dapagliflozin will also test their drug, an SGLT2 inhibitor in 4,000 patients with slightly worse chronic kidney disease, but also in people who don't have diabetes, depending on the issue that offloading the pressure in the glomerulus is one of the leading theories, will actually reduce events in that group as well. This will also be done in the EMPA kidney uh, uh, trial, which gets full points for actually having a slogan that I could find somewhere on the web. 5,000 patients with even lower kidney function um, and again, extending to non-diabetic uh, patients. And then the SCORED trial at the largest at over 10,000 patients uh, who have diabetes or a high risk of cardiovascular disease. And again, using a newer agent uh, as an SGLT2 inhibitor. 
And of course, we've already seen that's really important because a lot of the increase in ESRD is expected to be due to diabetes. But as Dr. Appel pointed out, glomerulonephritis is a persistent cause of somewhere in the order of 20% of uh, end-stage kidney disease patients right now. And there have been some changes here as well. So I think one of the most interesting has been that for a very long time, most patients with some sort of immunologic basis for their kidney disease have been treated with some dose of steroids. And if you go across the world, the use of steroids has varied dramatically in how exactly they're implemented for how long and at what doses. The testing trial tested this in a disease called IgA nephropathy, where it uh, took six months of steroids at a reasonably high dose to start and tapering off over a period of time, and found that it did look like there was a reduction in the development of end-stage kidney disease, but that there was also an unacceptably high rate of adverse events, predominantly serious infections in patients who were treated with the uh, high doses of steroids. And in fact, the study was stopped early because of the uh, high rate of infections, where for every uh, uh, five patients who were treated, one was expected to develop some serious adverse event. Now, if we port that information over to another recently completed trial called PEXIVAS, which is in a different uh, immune-related disease that affects the kidneys, ANCA-associated vasculitis, the same questions existed in terms of, we're pretty sure that steroids are helpful, but we're not sure how much we should actually use, and there's tremendous variation across the globe. And in fact, they found that the reduction in steroids of about 45% resulted in a 30% reduction in serious infections. So we're starting to hone in on newer or on better ways of using our existing therapies. Now, this also comes at a time when we expect the results of new trials that actually look at complete steroid replacement with more uh, targeted drug therapies to be coming out in the next year or so as well, which will again change the paradigm of how we use some of these older agents. Now, that will hopefully help prevent people going on to end-stage kidney disease, but it won't completely prevent it. We will still be faced with patients who are, uh, require dialysis. And if we take a look at what happens to patients who require dialysis, the leading cause of death is heart disease. So how can we improve heart health? If we look at it, heart health problems actually end up being responsible for about 50% of all of the deaths that occur in end-stage kidney disease. And there's been some recent advances here, and some we didn't necessarily expect. So the first was a trial called Pivotal. Pivotal was a uh, randomized trial that was based in the United Kingdom that really compared two ways of providing intravenous iron to patients. Most patients on dialysis will end up receiving iron. And there was a question as to whether or not it was good for people, bad for people, or indifferent in the degree of dosing that we actually use. And so in the UK, they enrolled a large number of patients and treated them either to try and maintain just above a threshold or treated them very routine, routinely and only cut back on the dose if they exceeded a higher threshold. And they looked at what the effects were on heart health. This is a confusing picture, but in the 2,000 patients that were treated, there was a slight reduction in the proportion of patients who ended up having a, uh, an event of the heart, brains, or a death uh, in those that were treated with larger doses of iron. At the same time, they required less in terms of erythropoietin and stimulating agents, which was considered beneficial. Now, confusingly, what happened was that when they published this article, they, uh, they didn't have the completely adjudicated results used in the final analysis, and it suggested that the effects on heart health were roughly the same in both groups. But in fact, when they went back and they used the correct data set, Talking to the group, it was actually the, the simple error of using a one instead of a zero in one place. It turns out that there was actually a substantial reduction in terms of heart-related events. And that that was predominantly in terms of heart failure-related events, which we're now starting to recognize as being one of the most common and deadly occurrences uh, in patients who require dialysis. So if we look forward, if we think about heart failure as being one of the most serious events that occur within our patients, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, or MRAs, are highly uh, studied in patients who don't require dialysis and have shown, been shown to be very effective in reducing the occurrence of heart-related deaths and hospitalizations for heart failure. This idea has been used in small studies in dialysis, very small studies. In fact, I'm responsible for one of them. In all of these studies, there's only been 54 outcome events to base inferences on, 
And I've blocked out the overall results here because that's so few events that it's completely unreliable to assess whether or not these drugs are actually effective. In fact, if we look at the cardiovascular literature, you require about an order of magnitude more outcomes in order to determine whether or not these results would be reliable. But that's being done. So there's two trials going on here, and this is one of the shameless plugs for my own. The ACHIEVE trial looks at a really old mineral corticoid receptor antagonist called spironolactone, which has been available for more than 60 years, in, compared to placebo in patients who require dialysis of any form. This is a global trial of at least 2,750 patients uh, that will examine whether or not this drug in its low dose reduces heart failure and cardiovascular deaths. There's another trial that's happening in France called the Alchemist trial that is almost identical but focuses on a slightly higher risk subset of patients who require dialysis and looks at whether or not it also prevents cardiovascular events and cardiovascular deaths. I think from a physician's perspective, we've often concentrated on these kinds of things. Can we slow the progression of end-stage kidney disease? Can we prevent heart attacks and uh, heart failure events that occur in patients who have established kidney disease. One of the things that's become increasingly clear over the last few years is that we have failed to acknowledge just how much effect the kidney disease can have on other aspects of health. And particularly, depression and anxiety have come up repeatedly now in the last few years as places where we haven't been doing a very good job. In a recent trial published by Raj Mahotra looked at two issues here. One was whether or not we can better engage patients in uh, talking about and potentially treating uh, depression after they have started dialysis by using an engagement exercise or visit. And another then at those patients who were engaged, looking at whether or not using a low-dose drug or using cognitive behavioral therapy as an interviewing technique could help reduce the symptoms of depression in these patients. Unfortunately, the engagement visit didn't do very much, wasn't able to get more people involved in the treatment of their, uh, their depression. And they did find that using a drug rather than cognitive behavioral therapy resulted in a slightly uh, uh, better improvement in their depression scores over the course of a few months. Now, that doesn't mean that we've solved the problem at all, and I don't think that everyone is gonna start on, on sertraline as a treatment for depression. In fact, part of what we think is happening is that we probably need to just engage patients better overall. Um, and some of the interest here was really on the phase one of uh, Dr. Mahotra's study and how do we get people involved in their care. One of the areas that we've proposed trying to do this is in the dialysis unit by routinely conversing with patients about not the dialysis issues that they face, but rather that all of the other issues that they face. We've done this through a study that's called Empathy, in which, random, in which um, dialysis units have been randomized to either partake in a system of care where patients are routinely asked about how they're doing in terms of an inventory of other health-related components, rather than their dialysis care components, or in addition to their dialysis care components, in a couple of different ways, and comparing them to units where it is business as usual. One of the interesting things here is that if you take a look at the authors list on this uh, um, publication around the protocol, authors two, three, and five are actually all patient partners who are involved in the co-design, and there's a cadre of about another dozen patients who operate behind the scenes in terms of material review and uh, process review and able to ensure that we could actually implement this in our dialysis units. Ultimately, this is involving about 3,200 patients. The first half have already been enrolled and we expect the results to be out in about a year and a half. Now, unlike those other trials, we're not looking at whether or not people's symptoms get better, we're not looking at whether or not uh, they have fewer heart attacks or they're less likely to die, we're actually looking at whether or not they have a more positive experience with the healthcare system. And so the major outcome here is actually communication and quality of life. So, very quick summary. Randomized controlled trials are definitely the best way to determine whether or not treatments really work, whether or not they do the things that we expect them to and the way we expect them to. And randomized trials get better the larger they are. And you'll notice that most of what I've shown is not just a couple of hundred patients, which uh, would used to be the standard, but now it's getting into a few thousand patients. And I think that we'll continue to increase the number of large trials that we do. We still need more 
randomized controlled trials, and we need to engage the entire community of both patients and care providers in order to actually undertake these. They're expensive, and they're difficult, they were easy, we'd already have done a million of them. But even amongst the cardiologists that we talk to who are the leaders in this area, they never have said that there is an easy trial. It's not that they have an easy time of it, it's that they have a culture that supports doing these, this type of work. And in the last year, we have seen major advances through clinical trials. There will hopefully be a reduction in the number of patients with diabetic kidney disease that progress on to dialysis. We will hopefully have better treatments for glomerulonephritis that are actually executed. And we will hopefully have fewer complications of dialysis and a better experience within the dialysis units over the next few years. There's going to be more trials. I've only picked out a very small number. I think that we uh, have nowhere to go but up and so that we can con continue to produce more and larger trials. And we should be focusing in on treatments for the problems that are most important to our patients um, and to the community at large. And with that, I'll end. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Courtney Fyrak. I am the Director of Patient Advocacy for Continuum Clinical. We are a global clinical trial enrollment company, and my team works with patient advocacy groups to, um, on behalf of sponsors, to help partner with them and to help meet them, have them meet their recruitment goals. I also previously worked for a rare disease patient advocacy group. Um, so today I'm going to talk about why advocacy group engagement matters, why it matters to patients, to industry, and the future of drug development. I have no financial disclosures to report, and my, the opinions here are my own. So we're going to talk about why patient advocacy groups matter to patients, to industry, and then kind of some best practices on either side for working, and then what each person in this room can do today um, to help um, decrease patient burden by including the patient voice into drug development. So what advocacy groups mean to patients? I'm going to Start with kind of a little story that's probably familiar to a lot of people that you're at your um, physician's office and you maybe had a blood test a few weeks ago and your physician is telling you that your GFR numbers continue to be low and they want to refer you to a nephrologist. Well, you maybe don't know what GFR means. You probably have never heard the term nephrologist before. Maybe on your way out, after your 15-minute appointment, you're, the nurse gives you some paperwork and you might look over it, but what's the first thing you're gonna do when you get home? You're gonna Google. <laughs> you're gonna Google what stage three kidney disease means and all of these things are gonna come up and some of them are going to be scary and some of them you're not gonna understand. But hopefully you come to AAKP's website or another patient advocacy group's website that's gonna have information for you. So you click on AAKP's website and you see that they talk about the stages of kidney disease and what it means. Um, they talk about what a nephrologist is and where to find them. And because you, and, and um, so patient advocacy groups really are that trusted source for patients and caregivers. Um, it's information that they're likely just not going to be able to get from their healthcare professional, which is just our health system today. Physicians just don't have the time. Um, sometimes you have questions in the middle of the day on a Tuesday, and maybe you can't call your doctor, you can't get an answer to the next day, but you could potentially go to one of these patient advocacy group websites and find that information. And this information and support is provided at a really critical time in your patient journey, and a, a real true connection is forged with this group. Um, patient advocacy groups can vary in what services they provide, but mostly they provide disease education, information on research, access to specialists, treatment options, clinical trial information. There's usually support services, access to support groups where you can meet other people who are living with the same condition educational events, community events, fundraising events like walks, and different legislative activities. So what do advocacy groups mean to industry? Well, there was a par there's been a paradigm shift between what has been more of a, a physician-centered healthcare system where it's a little bit more reactive, a little bit more prescriptive. You follow your doctor's advice. There might be a little bit of white coat syndrome happening. He's, you know, they're the physician. They know what to do. I'm just the patient. I don't, I, you know, I'm not the expert here. And pharma really looked at the physician as the end user of their product because they were the prescriber. But about 12 to 15 years ago, there was really this shift to more patient-centered. Patients were empowered to speak up, to be proactive about their healthcare, to work collaboratively with their healthcare teams. And pharma also took notice of this as the, the 
patient as the end user of their product because they were the one taking the, the product. So the term patient centricity was kind of coined and it's been a buzzword pretty much ever since that still, some companies still have a difficult time actually operationalizing what that means. But there's been some really good um, examples of partnership between industry and patient advocacy groups. Um, these are kind of two of some of my favorite stories. One is with Sarepta Therapeutics um, and the Duchenne muscular dystrophy community. Duchenne's is a um, degenerative muscular drug that affects um, mainly boys. Um, they're diagnosed at an early age. Um, and as a disease progressive, they lose function in their limbs. Uh, so in April 2016, there was previously no drugs to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But hundreds of patients, parents, caregivers, and family members went to the FDA when they were about to look at Sarepta's application and said, this is really important to us. We want this drug on the market. We know it's only going to help a specific subset of our patients, but we want this drug. Well, the FDA advisory committee still voted 7 to 3 against approval because they just didn't see the efficacy. So from May through August 2016, the Muscular Dystrophy Association and Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy mobilized their community, and they expressed the importance of approval to the FDA. Over 2,500 letters and emails were sent to the FDA, and the FDA changed their mind. They approved the drug after listening to the concerns of the community. So there was a drug um, on the market for Duchenne's, which really helped other companies express interest, and now there's multiple clinical trials for this rare disease. Another example is with Vertex and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Cystic fibrosis is another rare disease that affects children, and in the early 90s when Dr. Beale, who led the organization, these children weren't living past their adolescent years. And he was really frustrated that industry wasn't looking at developing drugs for cystic fibrosis. So he developed a venture philanthropy model, which was enabled a way for nonprofit entities like this patient advocacy group to take money that was funding um, from their fundraising and invest it in two for-profit companies. So their first investment was made in 2000 um, into Aurora Biosciences, which is now Vertex. And in 2012, the first drug for cystic fibrosis was approved, and that was Kaleidico. Um, and this really, again, spearheaded this, was spearheaded by this venture philanthropy. And in December 2014, the CFF sold their royalties for um, treatments developed by Vertex. And unfortunately, you can't see the number there, but it's $3.3 billion is what the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation got from that sale. And as someone who worked at a rare lung disease organization at the time, I can tell you we were all trying to figure out how to replicate that. Um, so patient input is really gold standard in rare disease. Um, it's where the patient advocacy function was born in industry, um, and there's been a lot of really great um, interest. There's been, you know, small patient advocacy groups, kind of kitchen table advocacy groups. Maybe it's a parent of a child with a really rare disease who um, started an organization and found a researcher who um, was looking at this genetic component of their disease, and they used money to help that researcher with an animal model, and that's how the drug development started. So there's some really good um, guidelines for interactions between pharma and patient advocacy groups. Um, one came out this year in the, or, I'm sorry, last year in the United States with um, rare disease companies and an organization called Global Genes. Um, and then in 2011, the um, EU had also um, put out some guidelines. And these, this is a great framework for how these organizations should interact together. There's also a lot of regulatory recommendations. Um, starting in 2012, under PDUFA 5, the FDA started internally led patient-focused drug development meetings. And this is an opportunity for all stakeholders, for patients and caregivers, uh, clinicians and healthcare professionals and researchers and regulators in industry to get in the same room and find out what was most important to patients. Um, at the organization I was working at at the time, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, we happened to be one of the first um, organizations that held this internal meeting. And what we learned from patients was that their um, cough was really terrible and debilitating and disruptive to their life, and their fatigue was really bad, and their shortness of breath from walking from their front door to the mailbox, that was what was affecting their life. But the drug companies were developing drugs with endpoints that really looked at their lung capacity volume, which can affect those things, but they weren't taking all these symptoms into consideration. Uh, with PDUF of six the, in the 21st Century Cures Act, the FDA started to look at is developing guidances for inclusion of 
uh, patient experience data is what they're calling it into new drug applications. And this really provides a framework to systematically collect this data and um, so that can be included, so every company is doing it the same. So right now I think there might be like a box that's checked in an application that says yes, we've listened to the patient, but how and why and where, and now um, companies might be required to do this. But that's important to understand is these are still just recommendations, they're not guidelines, they're not requirements. Um, for the time being, they're still just something that might happen. So industry really wants to engage patients, and patient advocacy groups really want to help drive therapeutic options for their community. So how do they meet in the middle? So some best practices for industry, start early. Phase three is too late. If you wait until your phase three clinical trial to engage patients and patient advocacy groups, it's going to be seen as very transactional. We know that you need patients in your study. We know that you're gonna to start to go to commercialization but you should have talked to patients and patient advocates very early on. I'm from Chicago. Vote early and vote often was born in Chicago. It's the same thing applies here. You can, have pro, um, you can have patients input into protocols. Protocols are written by scientists that are developed for regulatory approval. I would venture a guess that maybe nine times out of 10, those scientists have never met a patient living with the condition that they're writing a protocol with. So they might put things in like weekly visits when this patient population is still working. They can't get to a site visit every week or five-hour visits when there's childcare and, or transportation issues. So you really have to make sure these protocols are recruitable, and the best way to do that is by asking the people living with this disease. So a way to do that is through patient advisory boards. You can use patient advocacy groups to help find really engaged patients to participate, to help understand the recruitability of your protocol, um, and to help keep them engaged and meet um, and ask questions. What about the materials you're developing for your clinical trial? Do they actually resonate with the patients? Do they know what the inclusion and exclusion criteria are? These are all things a patient advisory board can help with. Uh, patient engagement is not the same as patient outreach or patient recruitment. I found this video from on the PCORI LinkedIn page um, a few weeks ago, and I thought it was really important. Um, Dr. Wilkins talks about how outreach is unidirectional while engagement is bidirectional. The term engagement gets thrown a lot around a lot, but it's important to understand that there's a difference, that engagement requires getting input from patients, but then also showing them how that input is being used. Where the goal of recruitment is to enroll study participants, but engagement makes the research more relevant. And she says that engagement means the participant community is somehow involved in, in the design, even the prioritization before the design, the implementation and the dissemination of the work. And I think that last piece is really important too because a lot of when results come out for clinical trials are not shared widely unless they're good. Um, but if you're a participant in a clinical trial, I think you probably wanna know what happened and patient advocacy groups can really help share that message as well. So stay involved and engage often. Avoid a transactional relationship. Start early. Make a long-term investment about the patient community, not just to enroll your study. And stay involved with, patient, with the patient community. This is especially critical for diverse populations. Um, my company has done some work with African-American women living with lupus, and we hosted lunch and learn sessions um, in various markets and interviewed women living with this disease, and they said, Pharma isn't talking to us. My doctors aren't talking to me about this. Where am I supposed to get this information? I hope you can come back because we want to continue this conversation. So it's really important to, to stay involved. And that helps you aim for true partnership. Work with patient advocacy groups to educate their constituency about all clinical trials. You don't want a pharma company to promote your clinical, I'm sorry, you don't want a patient advocacy group to promote your clinical trial. You want them to promote the importance of trials and that yours is one of the options. You can sponsor events, you can show up to walks, you can bring the patient advocacy group or patients into your company so they can really learn about what this, this condition is that you're working with and communicate the results of your trial. Transparency is key. Educate patients and patient advocacy groups about regulations. I think the pharma industry is either the most or the second most regulated industry in the United States. So there's regulatory and compliance issues that you have to follow as somebody working in industry. So make sure you talk to those colleagues and understand what you can and can't do when you're talking to patients. And then teach that your patient advocacy group partners about this as well. This is, these are things that most people don't understand. Um, unless you're working in regulatory and compliance, you probably don't understand what the rules are. So make sure to explain them so you can so patients know why maybe some of their input wasn't accepted it just couldn't be 
and be careful of overstepping. I um, attended a patient advocacy conference last week or two weeks ago, and there was kind of a heated discussion about closed Facebook groups. Um, closed Facebook groups are everywhere on Facebook with various different conditions and patients and caregivers in them talking about issues. And there's a lot of interest from industry to listen to these conversations and to get in these groups and not engage, but just hear what's going on. And it was said, like, just stay out of them. Just don't even go in there. Let them have their space. This is their space. There's other ways to get the information. So best practices for advocacy groups. Determine your organization's philosophy about working with industry. I think this is really important to think, to just sit down and think about as an organization what you wanna, how you wanna interact with industry. What are some guidelines and internal practices? Understand that you have limitations being a 501c3 or 501c4 organization. There's limitations to what kind of funding you can accept and how much from one partner. And then educate your partner about that. Share your guidelines with industry partners and help them understand some of your governance issues just like they're helping you understand yours. Match your goals and priorities. Check out the industry's uh, website. Check out the, the sponsor's website. How are they talking about supporting patients? Are they talking about supporting patients? Do they have a section on their website for patient resources? Because that might be a place where you can play a role and help them build that page out. And understand the role and function of your industry contact. Are they patient advocacy? Are they medical affairs? Do they focus on educational grants? There's some very large companies that as an advocacy group, you might actually be talking to somebody from each of those functions. And even if they are patient advocacy, they might be sitting in a different place. Um, so it's really important to kind of understand who that person is. And that helps to align your goals and priorities and keep a dialogue going to meet in the middle and align with your partners. And aim for true sponsorship by thinking be, I'm sorry, aim for true partnership by thinking beyond sponsorship. Find out is what is most important. Work together to achieve your mutual whimmies or what is most important to each side. Help your industry partner understand the importance of true patient engagement and that you want them to continuously show up. Writing checks is great, but you want them to show up and understand the, the patient community. And industry comes to patient advocacy groups because patient advocacy groups are the experts on their patient community. Um, they, they understand the patient insights and the patient voice, and that's what industry needs. Get creative with, sponsor, or with partnership opportunities. Sponsorship is important, but what else? $50,000 unrestricted checks for events and galas are really great, but what about some other partnership opportunities? Are there programs that can be developed? Are there clinical trial education outreach opportunities? This is, this is a way to sit down with your partner and really talk through what, what could be good for both sides. And finally, what does this mean for e each of you? Um, industry, if you aren't engaging with patients or patient advocacy groups, start today. Start with your compliance and regulatory colleagues and determine what parameters you need to work within. Patient advocacy groups, determine your organization's philosophy on working with industry and draft policies and guidelines. Socialize that information internally to, to everyone in your organization and then share that information with your partners. And there's those great frameworks that even though they're written for rare disease, it's applicable to chronic kidney disease or other chronic issues as well. Patients and caregivers, get involved. Make sure you're receiving updates from the groups that are important to you. Get those emails, log on to their Facebook page, follow them on Twitter. They're always gonna have great information that they're gonna share out to you. AAKP has a great place on their website. Um, aakp.org slash research, which has clinical trial opportunities. It also has market research opportunities. And this is important because if you see a market research opportunity, it's generally industry funded. This is how they're gonna try to get that patient voice. They are gonna look at maybe a focus group or a survey or some qualitative insights. So this is an opportunity for you as a patient to share your voice and participate in these opportunities. And be your own advocate. Remember, you are the expert on your own health so, so be empowered to speak to your physician if you want to explore a new therapeutic option, maybe a clinical trial. Bring the information with them and always share your story. And healthcare professionals, know the patient advocacy groups that serve your patients. Help them find those trusted resources for the condition, um, for their information and support, and, and have them avoid going to Dr. Google. We all know there's terrible information out there, so make sure that they can find the right information. And most of these groups have fantastic resources for HCPs as well, so you want to be involved. And lastly, discuss clinical trials with your patients. Be open if they bring you information about a trial and talk to all of your patients about clinical trials. We know that there's a need for minority representation in clinical trials, but there's also other represented groups like 
women are sometimes an unrepresented group in tr clinical trials, elderly, the um, older adults, LGBTQ. It's important to talk to everybody about clinical trials as a therapeutic option. That's it. Thank you very much for your time. Our next speaker is Mrs. Diana Kleins. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Diana Kleins. I am the executive director for the American Association of Kidney Patients and it's a real true honor to co-host this global uh, summit event with our friends at GW University. I've just been very impressed and excited about all the wonderful presentations that have gone on and um, Dr. Walsh and Courtney really um, set me up well to, to share um, a bit about my slides where we've heard a lot about clinical trials and patient engagement and I'm gonna spend some time telling you about what AKP is doing nationally and expanding globally to really support that effort and get patients involved. And so about four years ago, AKP's National Board of Directors um, implemented a new national strategy that really encompassed two centers, which clearly defines AKP's capacities, initiatives, and programs. So our first center is a Center for Patient Engagement and Advocacy. And this really um, entails AKP's advocacy efforts on the Hill, um, our action center, activating those patients when there's um, policy issues, legislative issues that really need the patient voice, contacting their, their congressmen. Um, we partner quite frequently with the American Society of Nephrology, the Renal Physicians Association, um, AST, ASTS, all the physician um, professionals associations when they go to the Hill because it's a really impactful partnership when you are talking about an issue and you bring a clinician and a patient so you get that clinical background and then you get the real world perspective of how does this impact a patient how does this impact their daily life and on our engagement side we have really expanded to um, reach out further out into the uh, the United States and into local communities and into states and so within our engagement center, one of the highlights um, of this center is our ambassador initiative, which was developed by um, our, my colleague, Erin Kale. And our ambassador initiative is identifying basically our supercharged um, volunteers, whether they're patients, caregivers, living donors, those who really have um, a presence in their local community, they're social media influencers, they really stand behind the message of getting the patient voice out to the community. So we've been really successful over um, the implementation in 2017 of this program where we're now up to over 120 ambassadors across the United States and we've just launched our global expansion of that with ambassadors in Canada and Ireland. And as Paul mentioned earlier in the comments, that um, we will be making an announcement of all the other countries that we've been um, associated with and contacting with to really bring together a united front across the world to, to fight kidney disease. And for our Center for Patient uh, Research and Education, um, this center really hits home to what we're t we've been talking about today and what we're gonna be talking about tomorrow as well. Um, AKP is the oldest and largest um, patient organization in U the United States. We have a really robust database that we're continually finding additional um, data collection on about our constituents. So that way we can partner with um, all sectors of the kidney community, whether the private sector, our industry partners, um, partners such as Continue Clinical, uh, Continuum Clinical, to really um, identify those patients that would be eligible to participate in market research that would have an interest and qualify for a clinical trial to really let them know about the opportunities that are out there. And within our database, we can geo-target, um, we can segment the database so we can be as efficient as possible when we're doing that outreach with our patients. Um, we quite frequently um, recruit patients for surveys, focus groups, um, cognitive interviews, and we've really found that um, it, it's very easy for us. AKP is a very trusted source among our, the renal community and um, the patients and their caregivers, they really wanna have that voice. And as Courtney mentioned, there has been a paradigm shift over the last you know, 10 or 15 years where um, you really can't get anywhere without starting with the patient first.
Um, so during the past 16 months, um, AKP has been contacted by a number of companies, over 63 companies, um, investment firms, uh, major investors related to trial and research. Um, and as um, Dr. Walsh mentioned, it's, it's really wonderful because AKP is helping pull that patient in early in the study process. So we've been involved in study design protocols, uh, patient consent forms, really getting that patient to or those ambassadors to review the material to, to make sure that it's understandable that this is a trial that is actually going to identify and fill a need and a void that's out there for the patient um, and um, their quality of care, their quality of life. And um, this is just a, a quick slide. It's not all encompassing, but it's just a, a quick representation of a lot of AAKP's partners, our professional association allies that we partner with quite frequently, um, our industry partners, and then we also um, partner quite frequently with um, federal agencies, um, CMS, uh, CDC, NIH, HHS, um, all the, the alphabet soup that, that is out there um, to help uh, identify patients for their, for their needs, for them to hear their voice, and to also connect them with patients patients that you can't normally find on normal communication lines. They may not be, you know, on, on social media. They, they may not, you know, be savvy with, with email. But AAKP, through our ambassador program, through our networks and our partnerships, have been very successful in identifying that community, which is really the underserved community and really those people who need to have a voice in a lot of these trials and um, the, the innovations that are coming. And um, as I mentioned, our, our National Ambassador Initiative, um, we are close to um, locking down all 50 states, which is really exciting. Um, as I mentioned, we're up to over 120 ambassadors who have their own networks and continually push AKP's message, um, opportunities for patients to participate and advocacy, um, research opportunities. Um, they represent us at conferences, technical evaluation panels, um, coalitions throughout the renal community. Um, and um, as I mentioned, you know, by, by fall of 2020, we do have a very ambitious goal of having over 400 ambassadors for each congressional district. And we saw this slide earlier today, the, the heat map. Um, you know, kidney disease knows no bounds, and so it's really wonderful that we have so many countries represented today, and we're having this this discussion. Um, one of one of many discussions we'll have, um, and this is really why AAKP is being very aggressive with our global expansion. We um, have been contacting and, and working with um, our international counterparts for some time, but we're really w working to formalize all of that and, and really launch launch our global expansion. Um, and um, we really we kicked off the, uh, the our global expansion initiative in May of last year when uh, Dr. Barry Smith invited um, us to uh, Paul Conway to the United Nations talk to, to speak. So that was a great opportunity to kick that off and just a sampling of some of the countries that we have been in contact with to um, you know, lead that expansion effort. And um, just to kind of highlight, and, and Courtney really kind of highlighted a lot of what I'll probably be just flipping, flipping through, but AKP does a number of what we call flash surveys, and it's a really great opportunity to get some really quick um, information from patients and caregivers about a particular topic. Um, these surveys are pretty much live for about 48 hours, and we get hundreds, um, thousands of res responses depending on the, the topic. And um, we participate in IRB and scientific surveys as well, but these flash surveys really give some great raw data and information that we can share with our partners that we take when we're having conversations um, with um, you know, representatives at the legislative and executive branches. And so we recently did one on um, patient insights on clinical trials. And I'll just kind of roll through some of these, these questions, but when asked and respected, kidney patients will honor the ideal of placing their suffering in service of others. So as, as you can see, um, with the question of, you know, would they be, as an individual suffers from kidney disease, if they felt their insights were valued, would they participate in a trial? And the answer is overwhelming, yes. 
Um, and have you ever been asked to participate in a clinical trial? The answer is no. So as Courtney had mentioned, um, you know, talk to your patients about clinical trials that, that are going on. Um, the, uh, the clinicaltrial.gov isn't always a user-friendly website for patients, so that's why advocacy groups like AAKP, we have a page on um, you know, our website where it's really easy for patients to search about trials that they're interested in. When we partner with what we call clinical trial awareness campaigns, we're raising awareness about opportunities for um, our constituents to get involved. Um, and then just rating the experience. Um, a lot of patients, when they do get involved with trials, they do have a good experience. And I think that has a lot to do with paying it forward. Okay. Um, and um, whether you participate in a trial or not, which one of the following do you consider the greatest risk? We were able to um, identify that patients felt that the greatest possible risk was to their overall health. So a lot of these flash surveys are getting questions that we can then you know, provide responses to our partners that'll help them tailor and get some insight into how can they develop the conversation and the material for their clinical trial. What's of most concern to patients? What should they address up front and how should they address it? Um, and then there's just um, but um, this is, you know, this just gives an opportunity of one of the many capacities that, that AAKP has. Um, and, you know, again, we, um, we partner quite frequently with Duke and Emory, Northwestern, UPenn. Um, you know, AAKP is, is a great resource to really get in touch with the patient and get that patient um, voice and involved in all of your projects. Well, thank you. Okay, uh, f first of all, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. I know we're running just, a, just on time, we're just a little past, uh, but I wanna thank all of our speakers for the excellent discussion, and I wanted to uh, I, I say that I think this highlights uh, the importance that physicians uh, um, put upon the results of clinical trials that require patient participation. The gold standard, as we heard is, and we know, is the randomized controlled trials. Uh, that gives us the best information about treatments and uh, things that we're looking for, breakthroughs in kidney uh, disease research. Um, I'll start off, I see there's one question uh, already, so I'm gonna go ahead, uh, right ahead. To uh, Victor Gura from Los Angeles. Dr. Walsh, I, on your uh, quote on the um, heart failure trial, what was the length of the trial? Because the, what I heard, perhaps I misheard, was a very long trial. So you're talking about the ACHIEVE trial? Uh, it was a trial on heart failure and uh, aldosterone receptor blockers. Yes, that's, so that trial is uh, projected longest follow-up time, so time from first patient to last follow-up, six years. Well, I heard 60, that's the, that's the <laughs> question. <laughs> Only if I'm doing a really bad job. <laughs> well, I hope it was recorded and I am still. <laughs> Doctor. This question is for Dr. Walsh. What's the role of crossover design in experimental studies? Yeah, so I think actually, um, you know, the, the textbook role of crossovers are for conditions that aren't permanent and that uh, may vary over time. I think when we look at kidney disease right now, we're actually doing a fair amount of work in crossover designs and symptom control. Um, and so I think we've identified, or patients have identified for us, that one of the areas of increased concentration should be to treat the symptoms that come along as part of kidney disease. And so we're starting to implement a number of trials that actually look at the use of agents and crossover uh, designs for those reasons. Thank you. Dr. Guzman. Yeah, this question is for Dr. Walsh. Uh, excellent talk, all the speakers. Uh, of course, as the uh, new therapies become available, and you mentioned credence, and that was on top of um, ACE yeah, inhibitors and ARBs, the hurdle becomes higher and higher. So for industry to be able to develop drugs now that can actually beat those barriers becomes more and more difficult, and you can see the number of patients and the costs that are usually sort of uh, involved in those trials. Can you comment on any other alternatives? Uh, can you comment on pragmatic trials, for example? So. 
I think the most important thing is to remember the randomization component is as an unbiased way of measuring the effects of therapies. Certainly, the method at which we start to examine the outcomes, whether you call it pragmatic trials or alternate designs, there's all sorts of different ways of going about trying to improve the efficiency of the trials. I think some of the things to really pay attention to, though, is, is that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So ensuring that we pay attention to issues around treatment adherence, identifying truly at-risk groups who should be included in the study, those sorts of issues don't get thrown away in just trying to achieve large numbers. In terms of the bar getting higher, I think that's a problem we should really welcome. If we look at cardiology as the example, setting the bar higher has been a great thing for them because the bar is higher. We have nowhere to go but up right now. Dr. Kimmel. Uh, far be it from me to stand between people and lunch, so I'll try to be extremely brief. I just want to talk about the NIDDK, which has embraced pragmatic trials. We uh, funded the TIME trial. Unfortunately, the dialysis unit was not amenable to our proposal to change times. We're now funding high-low, which is uh, an approach to looking at whether lowering phosphate, which is what we do all the time as dialysis doctors, will make any difference at all, and I'm excited about that. But regarding the focus of this group, patient engagement, the NIDDK acknowledges that we have been a little late in terms of embracing patient engagement, but we've embraced it wholeheartedly. And as examples, the Kidney Precision Medicine Program has patients who come to all the meetings throughout the entire meeting and listen to all the medical presentations and scientific presentations and are treated as equal partners. The Apollo study has an extraordinarily important community council, which has more members than the steering committee, and a patient voice is on the steering committee. Now when we were designing studies, we had a workshop about acute uh, kidney injury and uh, changing the landscape after hospitalization. We included patients in the workshop. We've started to include patients in the DSMB. So I think we're a little late in the game, but I applaud all these efforts at patient engagement, and I think we've been very, very pleased to partner with AAKP. Kelsey Kumanat uh, from Henry Ford Hospital. I do a lot of clinical trial work and follow kidney uh, and enroll lots of subjects in trials. One of the things that I think we've struggled with, and I don't know if this is the panel or more of the patients here can think about providing an answer, is retention in a lot of these studies becomes difficult because we've talked about forestalling progression. That doesn't mean eliminating progression. So when someone's in a randomized trial, their disease is going to progress over three to four years, irrespective of whether it's progressing less fast because our intervention is working or not. But yet, the patient, from the patient's perspective, they're participating in a trial and their understanding of it seems to be that I'm going to be better. And when they see their numbers get worse, they may be getting le worse less quickly. But that's something m more difficult to grasp from a patient perspective and to stay, that, to stay the course, so to speak, because you're thinking in the double negative as opposed to a positive. And I've always struggled with how to educate our patients in a lot of these progression trials because less fast is better uh, but at the same time, it's not educating someone as better. I was wondering if you guys had thoughts on how you would approach that or other folks or other patients that are here may provide some counsel on how to uh, approach that. Thank you. Um, it, what I would suggest and, and what we've we found as a best practice is getting the patient um, getting patients involved in the beginning having a core group of patients that are at the beginning of your trial where you're before you even get to the point where you're recruiting and you know sharing with them 
why this trial is going on, what you hope to accomplish, what um, could happen, and how best to relay that information to a fellow patient. Because as we've seen from a lot of the surveys that AAKP's done, patients want to get involved in trials. They want to make a difference, whether it's going to help them today or it's going to help somebody that's, that's yet to be diagnosed or in earlier stages. They really want to make sure that you know, as little people as possible go through the suffering of, of chronic kidney disease. So if you get that core group of patients and you get their insight on how would you like to hear this, how is the best way for you to understand that this may or may not help you, or over a period of time, this is you may still see a, you know, a decline in your kidney function, then I would say that would be the best way to help you design um, the communication materials um, and the conversation starters for recruitment of this trial and to make sure the patients really understand you know, what they're uh, participating in and what the expectations could be. Okay, with that, I want to thank, first of all, our entire panel, uh, and our speakers, and my co-moderator, uh, Ms. Suzanne Ruff. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, and thank you to Mrs. Kleins, Dr. Walsh, and Mrs. Fe Ms. Feyrich.